five more left. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. There you go, come on. All right, big introduction there. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome to the Meaningful Ideas Trading Club. We started there with Rocky. You know, circle back to that a little bit later on. But um, before we uh, get started, super grateful to have everyone in the room today. Um, this is our weekly event that we put on, brought to you by Holly Kaufman and Couch uh, Couser HKK Law Offices .com. Um, I'm going to moderate the room. Um, you'll see Ryan Couser here attorney at the law firm, uh, uh, law firm owner will moderate the room. A um, little bit just about ourselves. We're lawyers that are uh, uh, focused on family law, criminal law, traffic, personal injury, bankruptcy, estate planning, and landlord services. Um, the Meaningful Idea Trading Club was started as a place to share ideas on personal development and business development. Um, we've had regular contributors here, um, such as John Erline Photo, Timmy the Teacher, Northwoods Power Sports, Sign Shop of Sheboygan, On Par Engraving. And we wanna hear from all of you as well. So the way it works in here, guys, is you can drop in, drop out at any time. You're not gonna hurt anyone's feelings. You can just simply listen in if you'd like to do that, or you can share ideas with us. Um, we have some uh, general concepts in here that we're vulnerable. Uh, we like to exchange energy. Uh, we are open-minded about ideas. Um, we believe in these three things, though, that there's a treasure out there, that you are going to find it, and what you're looking for is worth it. Uh, we ask, uh, ask questions in here. Who is going to help us along the way as we figure out how to do things? We hope that this group is kind of a goldmine of information where ideas can be generated and exchanged, and maybe you have one great idea or you have several, but they're going to be yours and mine, and they're free. So uh, think about what is your plan, what's the destination, how you're going to get there, and who's going to help you. Um, specifically, we do like to foc uh, focus excuse me, on local businesses. Uh, we're kind of crazy about the concept that you can have things like a sausage maker or a toilet maker that becomes an international brand. That's Johnsonville and Kohler. So Ryan Kautzer and I have adopted the mindset that there's no reason why our law firm based in Sheboygan County can't be an international brand. It just takes our minds uh, limiting beliefs and uh, destroying that uh, and putting that to rest to, to get us there. Um, but we do like um, concepts and ideas from different geographies, right? So we've talked about this. Howard Schultz, he went to Italy, came back, he brought coffee to America, and now we have Starbucks. Uh, Ray Kroc, of course, toured America. Didn't figure it out until sometime he was uh, in his 50s, I believe it was, before he figured out the McDonald's process. And um, last week, we had contributors from Denver, Colorado, Kenosha, and that was a big help. So we're in here to ask for help, just like the way that Metallica was formed. We talked about this last week. Lars Ulrich put out an ad in a local paper and said uh, he wanted to start a band. And James Hetfield answered that ad in an old traditional newspaper ad, and together they formed Metallica, and they went on to 
sell 100 million albums. All right. So with that, uh, today we have a really special guest, entrepreneur Michael Morawski. Uh, Mike, I'm just going to um, uh, give a little bit of background about you, uh, and then I'll let you take it away. But Ryan Coulter, do you have anything to add before I get to Mike? No, we're happy to have everybody here. We're happy to have Mike here and um, to have him give some of his um, experience and expertise to um, sort of help us all develop uh, our, ourselves. So we appreciate you coming on, Mike. Thanks. Okay, awesome. So guys, use the chat feature, light it up, put questions in there, comments, thoughts. Ryan's going to be looking at that. I'm going to be looking at that. Um, and uh, we'll take your questions. We'll bring those to Mike. So Mike, just I'll give a little intro and I'll let you take it away because you've got a great story. So Mike, you're a 30 uh, plus year veteran in, in real estate investments. From what you've told me, you've controlled over $285 million in real estate transactions. That's amazing. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, an author, a real estate trainer, a public speaker, uh, and a personal coach. So you got a lot going on. It does it say in there and, and a host of a podcast, right? So tell us, Mike, thank you for being here. Welcome to the Meaningful Ideas Trading Club. Hey, thanks, Kyle and uh, Ryan. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's, uh, it, um, it's always good to be able to come on, share some experience and some knowledge to be able to help people see other uh, options and opportunities in their own life to grow. So um, yeah, so. for sure. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet. So Mike, if you want to just kind of, yeah, I'm not as familiar with your background. If you wanted to just give, give a little bit about your background, who you are and what it is that you're kind of, kind of give an outline, but what it is that you're, you got your hands involved in today. Yeah. Okay, great. So I've been in the, like um, Kyle said, I've been in the real estate business for 30 years. I, I started out as a residential sales agent and it's funny how I got in the business. I, I've always believed success leaves clues. And I, I woke up one morning, I had a general contracting business in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, woke up one morning and I was just burnt out. I was still banging nails and uh, had too much going on and uh, looked at my wife at the time and said, hey, you know, I can't do this anymore. So I decided to sell the company, uh, sold my company, took a year off. And during that year, I did a couple of uh, fix and flips. I bought some, uh, a two flat, went and fixed it up and uh resold it. Uh, you know, and this was long before fix and flips or house hacking was, was, you know, the sexy thing to do. Now mm. everybody does it. Right. Yeah. So, um, I can remember my wife screaming at me because of the nails on the floor, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but along the way I met a real estate agent that was really successful and I went to him one day and I said, Hey, Todd, you know, I, I think I want to go in the real estate business. He goes, man, I think you'd be good at, it. he goes, you have some skills that I think if you develop them, your sales skills, I think you'd be real good. So uh, I said, well, listen, could I shadow you? And he said, no. Uh, and he said, I'll do one better than that. I'm going to make you a cassette tape. And now I'm dating myself mm. for sure because <laughs> I don't think you can find anything to make a cassette tape on today, you know. Well, but, we, were play, we just played a clip from 1982. So remember that. So, I, you know, but, hey, you know, I was going to comment on that technology, uh, but the the uh, quality of the video versus the quality of video today, is that crazy how old yeah. that was? Remember? Yeah. So uh, it was pretty interesting to watch that, though. Uh, so I he made me this cassette tape, and I listened to it over and over and over again. And... I, like I said, success leaves clues. So I, I adopted those small uh, fundamentals that he had outlined on the cassette tape for me and went in the real estate business. My first nine months in the business, I sold 78 houses. I was Remax Rookie of the Year. I went on to build a team selling 125 homes a year. And in 2005, I saw the market starting to shift. And I knew I was going to have to go do something else, or I wasn't going to be able to keep the uh, same um, uh, income source and keep my team together and do the things that I was currently doing. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go in the apartment business. And I, you know, I didn't just wake up though and say, Hey, I'm going to go in the apartment business. It was something I had looked at over time. I had done a lot of work for a large apartment syndicator in the Chicago market and watched what they did. 
So I understood this. I understood the private equity model that you could raise private equity from individuals. You could marry it with a great real estate deal, stay in the middle. And as long as everything went well, everybody made money and there was okay. great success to be had. Yeah. So I went out and I syndicated my first deal. I put a deal together. I went and raised money and ran that. It was a small, a little 11 unit apartment building outside of Chicago. And from there, I went and raised $18 million in private capital. I bought $60 million worth of real estate. It was 4,000 apartments in five different states. Wow. I did that in 30 months and built a property management company managing 7,500 units. And today, as a result of all that experience and knowledge and some mistakes and stumbles along the way, today I'm in the coaching and training space and try to teach people and give back. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, a couple follow-ups, Ryan, I'm sure you've got some follow-ups on that. First off, Mike, where are you located today? I'm in Chicago. And, and, and so that's re really where you got started with the investment side of real estate. Is that true? Right. Yeah. I've been in Chicago forever. So. Okay. And so we might have people of all different levels in the room here today. Just a couple of things. Like what, when you say, when you syndicated your first deal, just tell us basically, real basic, what does that mean? Right. Okay. So a syndication is uh, when you bring together a number of people in different disciplines to help you put together a, a piece of real estate or a real estate investment. So I was what they call the sponsor or the syndicator. I find the real estate. I figure out the business plan around it meaning I have to go raise private equity. I have to get the documents put together. I have to find the management or manage that real estate myself, bring the private equity in, go get the mortgage. Now we close the deal, we run it and operate it. So I'm the guy who, who, makes, who, who brings all the moving parts together as the syndicator. Syndication is, is nothing more than just a grouping of people that are put together to move a, a real estate investment forward. Got it. Okay. And, and so you're not really doing that today. Is that true? You're, you've, you're not, you've talked about a lot of the coaching that you're doing. Right. I, okay. I am starting to syndicate deals again. Uh, so we are heading back in that direction, but um, uh, you know, I, I took some time off and part of that is because during that time I had a little bit of uh, a, a couple of challenges along the way. Okay. I want to talk about that here just in a second. So this is your website, um, My Core Intentions. Is, it, is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Really wonderful website. I was looking at this. Um, and, and if folks on this call are interested in what Mike is doing and everything he's up to, I mean, this is a really great website. You get down here to the bottom and it really lays it all out. You know, in terms of education, you have a blog, a podcast. I'm going to spend some time listening to this podcast. I'll tell you that. I'm a big believer, just like you in, you know, it was a cassette tape for you. Yeah. Um, I think Jim Rohn calls it university on wheels. Right. Was it Jim Rohn or somebody else? Yeah. I mean, no, literally, Jim Rohn. yeah. I mean, people close to me know um, in the car, I'm listening to stuff. Um, if I'm mowing the lawn, it's just a constant um, with this technology today to be able to listen to stuff is just is great and learn. So you have videos on here. You have a whole training course, coaching programs on real estate. We're going to come back to that a little bit later here today. So, so Mike, what were the challenges? What happened to you? Because everyone had, you know, Mike Tyson said this, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face, right? <laughs> uh, I love Mike Tyson. Yeah. So um, you're right. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And you know, I look at I look at business today and I look at life today, like not if you're going to get punched in the face, but when, because you're going to, something will happen, sometimes more drastic than others, mm -hmm. but, but something's going to happen to you. You know, I, I remember years ago, I, I think it was Donald Trump who, who talked about um, not if you get sued, but when you get sued. You know, mm. then you really know that you're in business for yourself. And okay. that, was, that was, that's the easy side of business, I think. So okay. here's what happened. I bought all this real estate. I bought it in a really short period of time. I was over leveraged. I grew way too fast. 
In 2007, I closed 17 real estate, tra real estate deals to buy 2,700 units. We didn't take time along the way to stabilize those, to build into them, to re-tenant them, to, to put a good foundation underneath them. Mm -hmm. I just kept buying property, buying property, buying property. And along the way, I kept growing my company. Yeah, before I knew it, I had 138 people working for me. Wow. Now, wow. Um, I, I say that because it was great to do all that, but way too fast. I was very unstable. It was like I was uh, sitting on a, on a four-legged chair, only on two legs, trying to pick my feet up off the ground and, you know, sit there. So uh, I was over leveraged. I paid too much for properties and I didn't pay attention to the details and the things going on around me. So as a result of that, 2008 came around. Um, 2008, we hit the worst economic crisis the country's ever seen. It was like plowing into a brick wall in a freight train at 200 miles an hour. I remember sitting at lunch with my CFO and where the news happened to be on. And, and I said, uh, they were carrying boxes out of Lehman Brothers by by the dozens, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And I looked at him and I said, man, we're screwed, aren't we? He goes, yeah, we're in big trouble. So um, it, it wasn't much longer that we came off the rails. And we came off the rails because uh, apartments are, are uh, funded and kept operational by NOI, the net operating income. That's how much money comes in from the rents that gives you the ability to pay the bills and then what's left over to pay the mortgage or the debt on the property. Mm -hmm. And what happened was people started moving out. We were in markets where the car industry was really heavy or the transportation industry was really heavy. And as a result of those heavy industries, people moved out of properties, people moved out of apartments, people went home, people stopped paying rent because they lost their job. So when, when our revenue went down, we weren't able to pay bills. Now I had some properties. Like, like, let, let me just jump in there really quick. I want to know, were you intentional about those markets? I mean, you know, obviously you didn't pick them when the people were leaving, but before people left, were you intentional about picking some of those markets? Uh, not necessarily, no. Okay. I didn't pick those markets because they were the car industry or the transportation yeah. industry. I picked those markets because at the time there were, there was good solid rent growth there was um, good, uh, stable population. Here, I bought a property in Anderson, Indiana. When I bought the property there, it was the number one city in the country to raise a family in, according mm, to okay. a, For a Forbes report. Within nine months- People here might dispute that, but- Yeah, yeah. within nine months, it was bottom of the list, right? Yeah. I had my property manager call me on a Monday morning from that property and say, Hey, in tears, I don't know how to save it. She goes, I have 42 moving, or I'm, I, I have 32 moving trucks in the parking lot and I don't have a scheduled move out for 42, 45 days. Oh, so oh. It, it, it was like, you know, that happened all over the place. So as a result of people moving out and the revenue dropping so drastically, we weren't able to pay the bills. So I had properties that were heading towards foreclosure because they were in such bad shape financially. And, you know, I've always been a guy that I don't want to bring any bad news to anybody. I don't want to tell anybody there's a problem or there's an issue. I want to make everybody think everything is great and going well, and we're going to be fine. Well, that I took that a little too far. So as a result of all this, I, I had properties that, that, um, were doing really well, but then some that weren't doing well. And I thought, well, listen, I've been in recessions before. I've seen recessions where the market's corrected 10%, and it's only lasted 17 or 18 months. This thing corrected 40% and lasted seven or eight years. So what I started to do is I started moving money back and forth between companies. I would take money from a profitable company, I'd move it to a non-profitable company, and I was advised by my attorney and my accountant. They said, that's okay as long as you leave a note in between them, which we did. So we were structured. Paperwork wise was fine. Here's the problem. I didn't tell my investors what I was doing. Mm. So for non-disclosure, 
I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges Man. and ultimately sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Wow. So wow. got wiped out, lost everything. Wow. Wow. Just like that. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. And it so was when you're talking about syndicating a deal, right. And then you're saying, you know, I didn't disclose to investors. That's kind of that process, right. Bringing right. people together and then telling them what's going on. Right. Um, so that, I mean, right there, it's like, you know, the ball kind of drops, right? I mean, that's, that, that had to have just completely shaken you to your core. Um, I can't even imagine um, kind of the panic, the alarms going off, the thoughts that you're having. Did you end up serving 10 years in prison? Uh, no, I, I served altogether about eight years and three months. Uh, okay. I, went, I was behind the wall for seven and a half years, came home, spent some time on home confinement. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, you go from living this lifestyle of being the neighborhood baseball coach and soccer coach and, mm -hmm. and being home for dinner at night and living in, you know, and I lived in a modest, modest home, you know. I, I didn't fly private. I didn't buy a boat. I didn't have big houses or a vacation home. I plowed everything back into the business, knowing that in 10 years, I could sell my company to a hedge fund or thinking I could sell my company to a hedge fund and ride off into the sunset and my wife and I could play golf for the next 20 years. Yeah. So that was the goal, right? Okay. And, and what happened was um, the markets just shifted so drastically that uh, we lost all that revenue in that. So all of a sudden I get, I get sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. I show up in prison uh, to serve my sentence. And now I'm living in a 12 by 12 room with three men I don't know, living out of a two by five locker yeah. with three green outfits and five pairs of underpants. Yeah. Talk about a culture shock. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, However, you know, I could honestly say today, though, I wouldn't change it for anything. Now, there's okay. some things that, you know, I have some issues with children that are mad at me still and don't want to talk to me. And Okay. But, you know, Those are the consequences, lesson. right? Right. Yeah. Consequences. I, I've got some questions about that rise in the fall um, that might be helpful to the group here. But before I do, Ryan, do you have, a, do you have any questions for Mike you got, or anyone else that has a question for him at this time? No, I, 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 Mike, I appreciate you sharing your story. That's not an easy thing to do. I, I guess from, from my standpoint, and you maybe get into this, it interests me how you, everybody has their ups and downs and yours maybe are more extreme than, than other people. Um, but I'm interested to, how do you get from where you were in the 12 by 12 to where you are today? And, and, um, you know, how are some of those fundamentals, um, I'm wondering if the fundamentals that you used before to start your business are still applying and, um, you know, so how do you go from picking yourself up off the ground to, to starting up again, you know? So great question. So, uh, I, I get to prison and I think my life is over. I go, you know, I'm waking up in the morning wondering how the hell did I wind up here and what, what did I do? And I thought my life was over. And there were a couple of guys around me that would, uh, were very supportive and just kind of make me get out of bed in the morning and make me get going and do some other things. Uh, I was there about 17 days thinking my life was over. And then all of a sudden my wife uh, let me know she was going to divorce me and leave me. And then my mm -hmm. life was really over. And at that point, I was like, totally devastated. So about six weeks into the prison, I walk into the gym one day, and, and I'm about 35 pounds overweight, Should, certainly don't feel good about myself, hate my life and hate where I'm at. And this guy walks up to me. And here's what he said. He said, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is take everything from you. They can take your apartments, they can take your houses, they can take your car, they can take your money. And they can turn your family inside out, but what they can't take is what you're made of. They can't take what's inside of you, who you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished, and what you know. Mm -hmm. You can get that 10 years back. Who told you that? Who told you that? Just another inmate. Just another inmate, right? And see, right. that's what I love, right? Like, sometimes these magical words, 
come from like these sources that you don't expect, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So he said, come to this gym every day, come to my class every day, start working out with me and you'll start feeling better. And I did. I started going to the gym. I started working out. I started losing weight. I started feeling better. I went to college. I got a bachelor's degree in theology. I uh, wrote two books while I was gone. Uh, one on multifamily investing, one on property management. I wrote an ethics study course. How ironic, right? Uh, eth uh, a federal prisoner writing an ethics course and teaching ethics in prison. I taught real estate and ethics for five years. I taught Bible study for five years. I was on an outreach program, went into the community, told my story about 40 times to local area businesses and college students. And I befriended a, a professor at the University of Minnesota. And he and I co-authored a paper together that we had published earlier this year in the Business Journal of Ethics uh, on it, an ethics case study. And it gets taught today at the college level for forensic accounting classes and sales and marketing classes. Um, so, you know, I did a lot. So uh, as a result of that, I came home with the intention of building a coaching and training platform that I could teach people how to build a, a, a multifamily or an investment real estate business, how to scale it, how to scale it uh, methodically without growing too fast, but more importantly, how to live a balanced lifestyle. Because I teach people all the stuff in the box, how to get from nowhere to somewhere, how to mm -hmm. get from zero to a hundred or a thousand units under management or whatever you want to do. But what, what I really teach people is outside of the box. Who do you have to become to get there? Who do you have to become to do that? See, we all have to change personally in order to grow professionally. And so what do we need to do to get there? You know, Hey, listen, it's okay to have a goal to make a million dollars, but what are you going to do with it when you get it? And who do you become along the way? Yeah, that's great. Hey, um, we've got somebody in the crowd who raised their hand and wants to ask a question. So I'm going to let them jump in. Okay. This is, Tim, this is Timmy, the teacher. He's been with us since, uh, I think, what, Timmy, week three. So, um, Timmy, go ahead. What do you want to say? What a question do you have? Uh, well, first of all, I think it's amazing that you're sharing the story with everyone and you're really telling them something that's uh, tragic and personal. It's that's tough, you know, and I appreciate that. But I have two questions. First is if you went to your attorneys and they said the paperwork between uh, what we were doing was fine, how on earth could they come after you and charge you and convict you of wire fraud if your lawyer said it was OK? So uh, great question, Tim. Uh, Wire fraud and mail fraud are two uh, very vast charges. Uh, Tim, you could actually go to jail, prison for paying your electric bill online. That's how vast it is. So if the government thinks you're doing something mm -hmm. wrong or you're up to no good, they can say, oh, we're going to charge you with wire fraud and you really have no way of fighting out of it. See, five years ago before I got charged, um, the SEC would have stepped in, they would have fined me $250,000 and said, go back and straighten out your business and don't let it happen again. But because of Bernie Madoff and all that stuff that happened just before I got in trouble, uh, the government felt like they changed all that stuff. So it wasn't the fact, though, that I moved money. It was the fact I didn't tell my investors. It was the non-disclosure piece more than anything else. So I know they were looking for scapegoats, and it looks like you got drawn in with that big wide net. They were trying to blame everybody. So, and I, you know, that's that sucks. I mean, big time, that sucks. But how did you get those investors in the first place? Was it just, you know... How do you bring in that, mm -hmm. that private equity? Is it, uh, you know, the relationships you built over the years or it was just a, a certain method that everyone takes to get that kind of investing? Good so, question, Tim. I love it. Yeah, great question. Uh, and I think that there's a little bit to unpack there. So uh, first of all, um, I, uh, so when I started raising money and meeting investors, I put a little ad in the newspaper that said, uh, real estate investors wanted. Hmm. And my phone rang off the hook for about seven days. 
and I raised two hundred thousand dollars on this six hundred thousand dollar apartment deal I was doing. Wow. It was it was crazy, and from there it just spiraled out of control. I I put some seminars on uh, every week in my office. Had new people come in uh, that I built out of my database. I went back then. Donald Trump was doing these uh, real estate investment uh, seminars around the country. And he only did it for like two years, but he did five events a year. He did in Dallas, New York, LA, Chicago, and somewhere else I can't remember, but we did uh, LA, Dallas, and, and Chicago. And I, I picked up probably uh, 2000 leads from people. And I'm a relationship guy. I love to build relationships with people. And so I called people and talked to them. I go have lunch, I have coffee. This was long before Zoom or, or social media, right? This mm -hmm. is, you know, pre any of that. So I'm an old, I'm an old guy, old school guy. Uh, I pick the telephone up and I'll call you and, and ask you if you're interested in investing, uh, if you're interested in, you know, passive or active investing. So. Um, oh, just by the way, one more plug here. See, you oh. too. <laughs> and it still works, yeah. bro. It still works. Yeah. Same. Mike, Thanks, I had no idea that, that you were doing that by putting out an ad in the newspaper, which I think is just <laughs> crazy. I mean, we talked about that Metallica story last week yeah. with the advertisement in the old school newspaper. And so it's really interesting, you know, you, you put out the call and people show up, right? Um, so you said something interesting and, and then I, I kind of want to talk about this and see if anyone else wants to jump in and talk about this in their own personal lives too. You talked about changing yourself, right? And so there's this concept that if you want to change your outcome, you have to change. And it sounds to me that you were in this position, you're growing and making a lot of money. And, you know, once that, that bottom fell out or you hit bottom, um, you really had to change yourself in order to change your outcome and then the future outlook of your life. That's an obvious statement, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. So my tie into that, I, <laughs> you know, Rocky Three. I've loved Rocky Three. This is the one where he fights uh, Clubber Lang, uh, Mr. T, and <clears throat> it, it, it's just crazy. The arc in that story is somewhat similar to what we're talking about. He was successful, comes off of Rocky Two, and I know it's a fictional character, right? He beats Apollo Creed. He's a, he's a champion, and then he starts having all these matches. And it turns out that the people around him are kind of protecting him and they're not really telling him what's going on. And they were setting him up with like matches with, uh, uh, I forget his name, his screen name, but it was like Hulk Hogan. Um, and it really, right? Thunderlips, Thunderlips. <laughs> there it is, I knew you would know. Thunderlips, right? And then so he gets in the ring with Clubber Lang and he just gets pounded and he just, and, and, and like he loses it all. He loses the title. Um, and he feels like he's kind of lost it, lost his whole life. And there was this moment and, and Apollo Creed steps in and says, look, I'll, I'll train you. You lost your trainer. Let's get, let's get back to, to, to Rocky and, and the world champion. And he tries to train him. And for a good portion of the movie, it's not working. And finally, Adrian, his wife steps in at the beach and they have this conversation. She kind of breaks it down. And she basically says, you know, you have to do this for yourself first. It's not for anyone else. You have to have the mindset yourself that you want to succeed and, and you have to believe in yourself. And he admits that he was fearful. He, for the first time in his life, he was scared. Again, fiction. But they get through that moment. He acknowledges that, like that realization that he is scared. He says it out loud. He's got there his wife saying, you take on that challenge, have the mindset that you can do it and you can do it, right? So he adopts that mindset. He gets to work with Apollo Creed. And what do they do? Did they train him like they trained him before? No, right? He had to change and he became a fighter that was not just a bruiser anymore. He becomes light on his feet and he learns some new skills. So in the rematch that he has with Clubber Lang, Clubber Lang's like shocked and surprised by this, this new Rocky that's emerged. Um, and <laughs> none of that really resonated with me as a little kid, but as an adult, it does because we have these stories of people getting knocked down and then you have to go out there, learn new skills, develop, um, yeah, develop new skills, right? And, and meet other people and figure out who's going to help you. So that's my long-winded 
um, rather than playing the actual YouTube uh, movie. But what anyone else have a story like that, or can can you can you figure a point in your life where you've had to do that and kind of figure out who you are, change what you're doing, and, and take a different approach to life? Quiet in the room today. Quiet in the room. You know, I always got to say something, man. Yeah, go right? ahead, Timmy. Well, yeah, that's what happened to me. I mean, my life fell apart. And I, it took me, I mean, two years to, to just try to get my head in the right space. Because when someone you, you're with for 28 years just walks on you, you're like, what? What did I do? You know, you don't know what you yeah. did. I still don't know what I did. But, you, you mean, in teaching, there's a, they, they call that, there's, there's a term for that. And, of course, I'm old. You can see, I can't remember what it's called. But it, it's the idea that when something happens, you don't turn it in. It's not a loss. It's just another opportunity. And your mind has to work to see where are the opportunities, recognize this is mm -hmm. an opportunity and everything that happens. Because I tell my students, you know, there, there's no, uh, there's no um, mistakes. It's just new lessons learned. So if you, can, if you can kind of internalize that and say, well, this is just another thing I have to get done. What's my plan? And then work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan and, and don't give up. Keep your feet moving like coach used to say. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll get out of that. You'll get out of it. I, I got something I could add. Um, prior to me starting my, you know, marketing career, I worked uh, 11 years at Kohler company as a manufacturing employee. And when there was a day when they were like, Hey, you no longer need to work here anymore. That was the day I learned I had a skill that nobody wanted. Mm. And that was very impactful for me, especially someone who had a young family at the time. And, you know, the fact that I was working there, I was making a really good living, right? But like, I was a manufacturing person that did one task and I couldn't take that task with me and make money somewhere else. So learning this new skill where I went and retrained myself kind of back to Kyle's example of learning new skills. So now the lesson learned for me was, you know, anything you do in life, and this is what I try to tell my kids is take a skill that you can take with you wherever you need to go. So if your career or your aspirations take you to Hawaii, cool, you got a skill that you can use there to earn some income, you know, so I'm very grateful for how I've turned my life around and where I'm at now. Um, but that's really the thing for me that totally drives me. And I, do try to project that to others as something to keep top of mind. So on those three examples, Mike's example, John, thanks for jumping in and sharing. Timmy, you know, in, in all three circumstances, right? Like Mike, you said this, you weren't paying attention to the details and the things happening around you. Um, John, you could probably say the same thing, right? Like taken by surprise when they said, hey, we don't need you back here anymore, right? Timmy, you said, somebody just told me after 27 years, that she's out, right? So like, what lessons do we have for people in this room, either with existing businesses or people trying to grow a business? Can you guys share? Like, how do you pay attention? Like, what should you do? Like, how do you pay attention to those details? Mike, you had 138 people working for you. How do you keep control of that, right? I always wonder about these guys, like Jeff Bezos. I mean, we got a lot from here. We have what, Ryan? 12 people. And I'm like, oh man, how am I going to do all this? How do I, how do I supervise? How do you supervise 138 people? How do you pay attention to details? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. When I talk about not paying attention to details and the things that happen around me, I didn't listen to people around me. Uh, quick story, I, uh, I never told my wife about business. So I never talked about, you know, hey, you know, I would tell some great things. You're like, you know, hey, we closed another apartment deal today or I raised some more money or mm. never talked to her yeah. about the details. Uh, just she worried too much and just wanted to keep that out of the, you know, off the kitchen table. Right. So, um, we, um, I, so in, uh, 2008, I'm trying to close an apartment deal and I'm in Cincinnati at the title company and I can't get funding from my office. And so my partner finally gets on the phone. It's like 10 to five on a Wednesday night. And he says, I don't know how to tell you this. Well, listen, when you're waiting for $500,000 and your partner tells you, I don't know how to tell you this, what do you think goes through your mind? You know, mm -hmm. 
And yeah. he said he moved money from the escrow account to the business account, thought he could have the money put back by then. And, and I went crazy. It's I, I said, hey, before we ever went into business, you knew that you don't do those types of things. This goes back to uh, what Tim said earlier that he kind of alluded to the fact that there was some, um, uh, listen, I got ganged up on and I'll tell that part of the story too. So, um, so anyhow, my partner uh, moves this money, moves it back. I, I dry close this uh, deal, which means I signed all the paperwork, didn't fund it, said, I'll have it funded by Tuesday, go back to Chicago. Over the weekend, I raise enough money to finish funding this deal and get it closed by Tuesday. But meantime, on Friday night, my wife and I go to dinner with my partner and his wife. And remember, I don't talk to her about business. She has no idea what happened on Wednesday. On the way home, she says, I don't trust him. And what do I do as a good husband? I say, yeah. hey, honey, don't worry about it. I got this. Yeah. And I didn't have anything. Yeah. But, but what I should have said was, tell me more about that. What do you mean? So when somebody around you says, hey, I don't like what's going on, or pay attention to this, pay attention to it. Because a week later, my attorney said to me, he goes, hey, I don't know what's going on over there, but I don't like some of the things your partner's doing. I think you need to watch out because I don't think he's got your best interest. I said, oh, Bob, don't worry about it. I got this. You know what? I yeah. didn't have it. And, and so that was the first incident, right? And there were incidents after that. But we don't pay attention. We get so focused and our blinders are on and we move so fast sometimes. I always tell people, hey, think things through, right? Think things through to the end. When, you are, when you're faced with a situation or you're going to make a choice, uh, think it through to the end. What does it mean tomorrow and next week if you do this right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. So... Um... I want to, I want to know, Mike, uh, I'm a guy, I, I think multifamily first, uh, tell us what, what's your definition of multifamily real estate? Tell, tell us that first. More than one unit in a building or on a piece of property. So okay. when you have more than one family, uh, you know, multiple single family uh, residences in locations. So, yeah. So, um, when, when I, I've always been interested in, in real estate and, and, and investing and, and having that passive income, if you call it that, right? My thought was it, it kind of serves as some insurance in a way. Um, I love being a lawyer. We love helping people. But I always wanted to have something else as somewhat of a buffer, right? So I started looking into you know, real estate and kind of went that traditional route of, okay, let's look at a duplex or something like that, right? And looked at properties at the end of the day, I'd, I'd add up the money and it would be like, you know, maybe a profit of a couple hundred, hundred dollars a month from like one, you know, one duplex or something like that. And for me, the suitability wasn't there because I thought, you know, that's not enough money to hire a property manager. That's a do it yourself type thing. I'm not a Mr. Fix it. I've got to hire everything out. And, and so I got away from duplexes and then I really started to focus on the multifamilies. And one thing I realized, I think, I guess, seems to me like banks are more open to the big deals than they are to the small deals. That's number one. But just the idea of having one roof, you know, um, you know, one boiler system, you call it, whatever it might be, right, is, seems to me like a concept that uh, is a little bit easier for me to, to handle, more suitable for me, and the idea of hiring a property manager. So for the folks in the room, why should they get excited about multifamily real estate? And how could you help people like me? or anyone else that's interested in that sort of game? What do you sure. do to help us? So there's a couple of ways you can invest. One is you can do it yourself. And the other way is to passively invest. Um, I always like to say that if you're a W-2 employee uh, collecting a paycheck, exchanging time for money, um, you have the opportunity to invest that money you earn passively into these types of real estate deals. What's... Uh, What's interesting is that somebody else runs it, manages it, handles it, and you get a report and you can say whether you like it or not. So um, when you look at these deals, there's ways to bet the sponsors. There's ways to uh, look at the deal to make sure that you're making a smart choice. 
I see a lot of people who come from the space of having a W-2 job where they invest in real estate like this. And then all of a sudden they start doing their own deals because they like it. Here's mm -hmm. a big thing though, economies of scale. So um, um, you kind of alluded to it when you said, hey, one roof, one furnace, right? right? I was in the residential space for a long time, Kyle. And what, what I did was I, I owned a lot of residential properties, but I had a hundred roofs, a hundred furnaces, yeah. you know, hot water heaters, uh, parking, you know, garages, garage door openers, washers and dryer. <laughs> but if I own a hundred units, I probably only have five roofs, you know, five yeah. boilers. It, it really condenses it down. And if I have to go collect rent, on a hundred places versus collecting rent in one place for a hundred units, it makes a big difference. So the time commitment is so much easier. Your economies of scale, you have the ability to grow a lot faster and, and bigger. Now I say that with some reservation because I did it way too fast. So like mm -hmm. I'm back syndicating deals now today. And as part of syndicating those deals today, um, I'm growing a lot slower. I'm playing, there's a couple of places that I'm spending my time right now. And one is uh, small multifamily, 20 units okay. or less. Okay. High rent growth markets. So I look at metrics like population growth, job growth, household income, yeah. uh, what the trends in the marketplace are, right? We don't just walk into these and say, oh, that's a pretty looking building, right? I'm, buy, I'm actually buying uh, 21 units in Tampa, Florida right now that you probably look at it and go, man, you're crazy. But you know why I'm buying it? Mm -hmm. Because I can go in, I can put a bunch of CapEx money, uh, repair money. I can put new tenants in the property. I can increase the rents and be out of the deal in three years. So now I can fix it up. I can sell out of it in three years for a profit. And my investors are very happy at, with it at that point. So, so that's a place I spend my time. Another place is 20 units to 100 units because that's a market right now that other people are not going into. Uh, we call it smart money. So, you know, the bigger apartment syndicators, the guys that do 200, 300, 400 unit apartment complexes are spending all their time in that space, which has left a, an opening in the space where you know, 50, 40, 60 unit apartment deals. Sure. Out. So Mike, one thing that I've seen, a you know, like just a trend in, in the last, you know, I don't know, I, let's just say the last five years, it seems that coaching that term and in, in different industries has just become more commonplace. Um, maybe I missed the mark on that. And I just discovered it recently, but uh, you know, we're, we love sports, right? So for us, it's yeah. super easy for us to understand when um, we understand that concept of, you know, taking a player like Michael Jordan, right? And then he went out and hired Tim Grover and Tim Grover trained Michael Jordan. And then Tim Grover trained, um, boy, who else was on his list? Uh, Kobe Bryant and a number of other athletes, right? And really kind of honed in on their special skills and just really brought that all out. So one thing I'm really poor at is delegation and really trying to get better at that. And as a law firm here, we're trying to get better at delegation. So one thing, and let's just say, for example, I've got this screen share up. I pulled it up to your coaching. You've got some different levels here where it looks like your group can provide coaching, which is really excellent. And so what my, what my question for you is, is so let's say now we're up in Wisconsin, but let's say I wanted to go hang out in Chicago, right? And I like this, this three flat here. I like to use Redfin and look at this, right? And, and if I was interested in a property like this, I said, gosh, I want to rent out a couple of units and I want to have my own, my own place there. And, you know, I pull up this and I kind of, you know, can see what's on the website and it tells me a little bit of information about this property. Of course, the pictures you talked about that saying, Hey, you know, looks nice and all that sort of stuff. What on top of that, you know, when we get back to to your coaching here, how do you help a guy like me analyze if that's a good deal for me? Sure. It's a great question. So one of the things that I'm very good at is due diligence, underwriting. 
So remember I talked about population growth, job growth, household income. That goes back to what's your buying strategy. So when I work with people, I want to discover those things first. Hey, what do you like? What do you not like? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not a flat roof guy. So if I'm going to buy 100 units, it's got to have pitched roofs. It's got to be garden style, two two stories, three stories. I don't like tall high rises, right? There's maintenance issues. There's things that go wrong that, that I don't like to deal with or have to deal with. So everybody has to put together a buying strategy. You know, I think the buzzword today is an avatar, right? Uh, if mm-hmm. you're going to hire somebody, Kyle, for your uh, office or your office staff, you probably yeah. want to write an avatar of who that person is. So when they walk in the door, you know who they are. It's the sure. same thing when you buy a piece of real estate. Know what you want to buy. Know what you want the return to be. Know what you're looking for. So how do so you get coach, there? Well, how do you jump in? So if, I, if I've got something in my mind, I know exactly what I want. I have my criteria, the neighborhood, the town. I come to you and say, hey, help me with this deal. I help you refine it. And then I help, uh, I help you decide how to go look for it. I help show you ways of sourcing deals that might not even be on market deals that might mm. be off market deals. Right. Then, right. We go to, then we go to underwriting. You know, I have a tool that I use that's a really robust, let's call it a robust uh, Excel spreadsheet. It's pages and pages of data. You put some inputs in on the front page and it spits out all this stuff for the next 10 years, right? Your return, your return by year, your demographics, your, uh, uh, what you can expect for cash on cash or an IRR or an ROI. So we teach all the language, right? What's a cap rate? Yeah. What's an ROI? What's an IRR versus what an ROI is? Yeah. So we teach all the, all the language, all those things. I, I help people understand the differences between other asset classes and what their temperament might be. Help you build your goals and, you know, hey, to go buy one multi-unit building is one thing, but if you want to scale your business and have 10 of those or, or more, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we help you get there. Okay, cool. So anyone interested in that can reach out to you here at your website, right? Right. Like right. Yeah, or they can uh, email me directly at mike at mycoreintentions.com. And, and okay. listen, even if you're not interested and you just want a conversation, like I said, I'm a big networker. Um, yeah. I love talking to people. I love building relationships. So feel free to uh, reach out. Mike at mycoreintentions.com. Right. Okay, so I got that in the chat. Um, I want to share this with you guys. Um, so last week we had on the uh, Olson Brothers. You guys might remember that a band um, making music, man. And um, uh, we promised some t-shirts for folks that wanted them. So we got some people that that, uh, put some orders in and uh, they got their shirts, man. Doesn't that look good? Nice. Yeah. 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 So um, kind of music. Oh, guys, man, should we play it? Should we play it? Is that the best way to describe it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You got to play Mandy. Play Mandy, dude. That's the, that's the bomb. There he is. Uh, okay, let's see. Let me find it. I think it's Molly. Is it Molly? Yeah. I, <laughs> you I right. the song off to like 20 people. It's a great tune. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, we didn't really get into to Luke's story last week. Here it is. We'll play a little bit. I just want to say go pack go to the Chicago guy. Your country, we like the same old song. All right, so so that's Molly by the Olsen brothers. But you know, you know, we did we just had so much to go through last week, but you know, Luke's story was he was on his band, he was formerly with a band called the Walters and they were on the stage at Lollapalooza. You know, that's a pretty big concert stage, right? And he kind of alluded to this last week when he kind of talked about his entrepreneurial mind though, that in his words, he does, doesn't give a shit. And he said that's worked well for him at the same time, it hasn't, right? And it kind of self-sabotaged there and that band fell apart. And, you know, Mike, like your story, he was, 
he was, he was coming up. They were coming up fast. They're getting a lot of success. They're getting a lot of play in Chicago, appearing on local television, um, making all the music festivals there in Chicago. And then it all fell apart. And just, just like that went away. So now he and his brother have uh, started the new band, the Olsen Brothers, and uh, we had him on last week. So, um, Timmy, I think you ordered a shirt, didn't you? Yeah, I got the camp shirt, man. It's on its way. All right, and Timmy, Mike, just so you know, is start. He wants to start an online service called Timmy the Teacher, right? You said this program's been helping you. So, how far along are you on that? What progress have you made, Timmy? Um, I've got the website up. Um, I've got the domain name. I've got uh, started putting the, the pictures on it. Dude, uh, what's the website? Uh, Timmy P, the science guy. Timmy, I'm putting it in the chat. Timmy P, the science guy dot com. Yep. And this yep. is up and running. I think so. Uh, maybe it's Timmy P science me. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> we got to get it straight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Anyone else have any updates uh, that they want to share with us? Questions for Mike or anyone else in the room? I just had one question for Mike, just real quick. I know we got a, just a couple minutes left. Mike, when you talk about raising money, at one point you mentioned, you know, you didn't have the money on a Friday. You raised a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars over a weekend. What was the, what was the average amount that came from each investor? Were you talking like a, a hundred people who each invested a thousand dollars? Were you talking two people who each invested a hundred, hundred thousand dollars each? I mean, what was the kind of the spread on the investment from your investors? Yeah. Um, my, most in, most of my investors were 50 to a hundred thousand dollar investors. I had a couple that were, you know, large, big money and a couple that were smaller than that. But most of my investors were in that 25 or 50 to a hundred thousand dollar pocket. So when I raised that money over that weekend, I went specifically to, to three or four people I knew who had money sitting on the sidelines and I had to give them a little bit more. So I had to give away my equity, uh, some of my equity in the deal, um, which I gave away my partner's equity, not mine, but because that turned out to be a pretty good deal we did. And plus paid them a little bit more on their return on that. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, you've got to bend things a little bit, right? So, so um, Mike, somebody did have a question. If you could briefly tell us what happened to your partner, they wanted to know, did he go to prison? Yeah. So great question. Um, I was on vacation in uh, August of 2010. When I came back from vacation, my partner handed me two business cards, said, hey, you need to find a criminal defense attorney. And I didn't realize we were in that much trouble. I knew we were having problems, but I didn't know how much. Fast forward about eight months, um, I discovered that my partner, while I was on vacation, had testified at the grand jury. So he and our in-house legal counsel and director of finance um, carved a deal out with the government to cover their own asses, excuse me, uh, to, and I got 10 years, he got seven and served 30 months. And mm -hmm. the uh, director of finance and the um, uh, attorney did not get in it, you know, get charged at all. So of course not. Yeah. yeah. So listen, let me be really clear though. I broke the law, okay? Yeah. I'm not saying I didn't do anything wrong. My, my partner and I were friends for 25 years we, uh, before we went into business together. And uh, we always had, we had this mantra, hey, I would take a bullet for you. And mm. when it came right down to taking that bullet, he yeah. didn't take it. So yeah. it was really interesting. So, hey, listen, I'd like to give a copy of my book away. Okay. Um. If, if people want it, you can go yeah. download uh, an ebook. It's uh, just go to mycoreintentions.com forward slash exit plan. And it's your complete guide to multifamily investing and why you need an exit plan. And oh, there it is. So um, I wrote that because I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years on coaching and training and books and tapes. I actually still have a coach in my life today, but I always walked away from those you know, feeling empty, like I was missing something. And the, the funny thing about real estate is you make money when you get out. They always say you make your money when you go in, which is true, but you don't realize it till you get out. 
So there's different ways to exit, different ways to uh, restructure a deal. So um, I, 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 that's why I wrote the book. And that's, you know, really one of the big things that I talk a lot about. Yeah, I feel like, Mike, we could probably keep going today. Yeah. Um, it's crazy how fast the time goes here. We've had, you know, um, just a lot of information that you've given us and stuff to think about for sure. So um, before we close the room, um, so on your, your offer here on, on your book, how does that work? How do you want people to get the book? Yeah, just go to my website at um, mycoreintentions.com forward slash exit plan. And you can download a free copy there. Okay. So free copy guys, go to the website and get a free copy of the book exit plan there. Mike, thank you so much for being here. It's one o'clock already. And I really, we're super grateful for everyone that's joined the room um, and uh, contributed today um, in the chat. And Hey, look, we hope you come back every week. We're going to continue to do this. We committed to doing 52 of these. This is show number seven. So we're going to keep going and uh, bring interesting people on and interesting topics and try to help everybody and have a team approach to make it all better. So we truly appreciate you being here, Mike. Anyone yeah. else have any closing remarks, questions, comments before we close the room? Thanks, Mike. And uh, Kyle, you're, you're, you're turning into a pretty good MC, man. But I got to tell you, next week we should do liquid lunch. Liquid lunch. Okay, yeah. <laughs> hey, man, the, you know, there's no rule against it. So, Yeah. Thanks, Hi, Mike, guys. for coming on. Appreciate it. Appreciate, Appreciate you being uh, open and honest with us today. It's, it's great. Thanks again. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah, and if, yeah. if we weren't recording this, I would say you should find that guy and kick his ass, but I'm not going to say that because we're being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's good, man. Round of applause for everybody here. Dude, if you showed up, man, you want to make a difference in the world, and that's awesome, and we love that. So hopefully we'll see you here again. All right, guys? Meaningful ideas. Trading Club for uh, May 20th, 2021 is closed. Thanks, guys. Later. Thanks.